Hello, spooky bitches. Welcome to episode five of the Scaredy Cat Skeptic podcast. We're coming up to spooky season and I can already feel a lovely chill in the air. Bit of a relief after that sticky, clammy summer, let me tell you. We are not cut out to deal with that much sunshine in the UK. Nothing works in that heat. Bring me a nice grey sky and a temperature of around 17 degrees Celsius and I'm one happy bunny. But hopefully... This is the final nail in the coffin of summer 2023 and autumn will start in earnest, bringing crisp leaves and conkers and unregulated bonfires that are a bit dangerous but nobody minds because it's customary to burn the effigy of a historical political activist and bake potatoes in his figurative ashes. It's a really odd tradition, isn't it? But fun and autumnal and there are toffee apples and treacle toffee and hot chocolate. It marks a season when we can start putting cinnamon in stuff and making it hot. Bloody love a mulled wine. But not before... Ladies and gentlemen, we have passed through that wonderful time when we can celebrate Samhain, or as it's more commonly known, All Hallows' Eve. A night when those who have died are able to return to Earth to visit their loved ones, which begs the question, what are they doing the rest of the time? Anyway, Halloween aside, I've decided to add a little section at the beginning of the episodes where I talk about the spooky things that have happened to me in the last few weeks. Because the reason this podcast came into being wasn't simply because of an isolated incident with a giant worm 30 years ago. Weird shit happens to me all the time, just constantly. Most of the time, I write these things off as weird, but probably has an explanation I don't know about. Or I desperately grasp at any explanation for them that doesn't scare the shit out of me. But sometimes they just really get under my skin and it takes a while to stop worrying about it. Currently, there's a midnight scrabbler in our house. It started about three weeks ago. I was in bed with the door closed. Tom was still up and in the living room, so I was alone in the bedroom and I couldn't sleep. Story of my life. So I got my Kindle out and was just about to start reading when I heard two long, slow scratches at the door. I assumed it was our cat Ava, so I sat up and sure enough, it happened again. I got out of bed and opened the door, doing that embarrassing thing that cat owners do where they talk to their animals like they're their children. But she wasn't there. I glanced around to see if there was anything around that could have slipped against the wall or door and maybe caused the noise, but there was nothing. Freaked, I went into the living room to see what Tom was up to. It was such a clear noise and it felt so real that I assumed either Tom or Ava had been up to something. But Tom was curled up on his computer chair and Ava was nowhere in sight. I told Tom what had happened and he said it was spooky, but then he said, You were asleep, Em. And normally I would agree with him. I wouldn't usually even bother to tell anyone about something weird that happened while I was in bed because I get the sleep issues and what have you, but I know I was wide awake. I sat up and I waited to make sure it was really happening. I had my Kindle in my hand. Then I decided that maybe Ava had run off when I opened the door. I don't know why she'd do that. And I opened the door so quickly after the second scratches that I don't think she could feasibly have got away from me that quickly. But she was fast asleep in my studio and I woke her to check, but her little furry face was all groggy and puzzled. So it definitely wasn't Ava either. Bamboozled. I went and got back in bed and picked up my Kindle. Seconds later, the scratching happened again. I ran to the door and opened it. Nothing there. So I left the door ajar and went back to reading. It didn't happen again after that, and I'd almost forgotten the incident until about a week later. I was in a similar state, but I'd only just got into bed when the scratching started. I sat up. The scratching noise came again. So I looked at the strip light under the door and I couldn't see a shadow from little paws or feet or anything like there was someone in the corridor i waited it happened again i shot up and flung the door open nothing there i've left the bedroom door ajar ever since and it means i'm waking up a lot more because i'm such a light sleeper and tom's a chunterer but there's not been any scratching since then last week tom had gone to bed before me which is unusual and he basically turns into michael flatley lord of the dance in his sleep I hadn't been sleeping well, obviously, and Tom's been a bit poorly recently, so I left him to his jigging and went and got on the sofa in the living room. Seconds after I closed my eyes, I heard fuzzy, muffled footsteps like feet on carpet and a cracking noise that Tom sometimes makes when he first gets up. I'm not sure if it's an ankle or a hip, but it's that definite knuckle-type cracking noise. He also moves around very quietly, 
It's like living with the Slender Man. He just, he's very tall and thin and willowy and he moves silently and appears behind you wearing a long dark robe, this very tall, pale figure. Terrifying. He's also cold to the touch like a vampire. Anyway, it could have feasibly been him and that's what I assumed I was hearing. So I took off my children's alien sleep mask. I know what you're thinking. What a sexy bitch, am I right? The lights were off in the living room but the moon was really bright and I hadn't shut the curtains so I could see clearly that there was nobody there. I sat up and there were no more noises so I put my mask back on and I lay back down. It happened again and this time when I took my mask off and sat up the noises carried on. They weren't loud but they were clear. Creaks like floorboards moving, the odd tap, some scratching and banging coming from the walls, a bang here and there. It was happening on either side of me in the corridor to the studio and the bathroom in the hallway in the kitchen the only place that I couldn't locate any sounds were was the bedroom so I turned the big light on and I sat there listening to it for a while quite scared by this point eventually I just picked up my bits and pieces and my pillow and my sleep mask and crawled back into bed with Tom if in doubt use your nearest and dearest as a human shield I couldn't hear anything from the comfort of the bedroom and eventually I managed to drift off The morning after, I started telling the story of what happened and Tom suggested it might be our upstairs neighbour. He is a noisy man and he is up at all hours and he has this dog that wags its tail really hard and it makes a thumping sound on the floor, which is obviously our ceiling because we're in a flat. But I'm used to his noises and this noise was in the room with me and all around me. It was in our flat. Sometimes it felt like it was below us and we're on the ground floor. Then that same day... After I got up, I went to the kitchen after dark and I turned on the strip light, but it buzzed loudly, went a bit blue at the edges and started flickering up and down the middle. Irritated, I turned it off and on and then it blazed and went out, plunging me into darkness. I'm a bit of a prepper, so I went and got an emergency camping light. I mentioned to Tom that we needed a new strip light and we arranged to go and get one the day after. But then the day after, Tom went into the kitchen and the light was fine. It's been fine ever since, and it had popped like the bulb had gone. So I don't understand how it made that noise and it still works. So, I mean, what is going on here? Skeptical things to note. Ava may look like a princess. I'll post a picture to the show notes. But she is a stone cold killer. Honestly, I'm low-key proud of how good at hunting she is. She's seven years old, so around 40 in cat years. But she plays out all day, every day, and she squares up to foxes and she gets into fights. She killed a pigeon once, but it was too big for her to get back inside with it. So she just sat outside with the corpse of a pigeon while the other birds went absolutely crazy about it. And when I found her, she was wincing at the sheer cacophony of squawks as the friends and family of said pigeon kicked up a stink at this murder most horrid. She's she's such a monster, honestly. But we're used to it. She brings us little snacks on legs fairly often. The flying kind are usually dead by the time she deposits them at our feet. But the ones with tails, she likes to set down alive and then chase them around, like a sadist. So, it is possible that she's brought something in without us knowing, dropped it, and it's run off. And she's lost it, and now it's bred and there are mice in the walls. And I know that mice can be noisy and I know that mice are noisier than you think they're going to be. It sometimes sounds like a herd of elephants. So it could be that. I'm not ruling it out. We haven't had any droppings and we haven't seen any bite marks in anything as yet. But you never know. On the other hand, spooky things to note. About a month ago, I ran from the living room to answer the door. As I passed the hallway to the bathroom... I saw a tall, dark figure in a long robe standing there. I kind of nodded at him. It was definitely a him, and it definitely wasn't Tom. As if to say that I'd be back in a moment. But I ended up chatting at the door, and when I got back inside, the figure had gone. And I never trust things that you see out of the corner of your eye, because your mind can so easily play tricks on you. But I will say that our hallway is cream and white and very plain, so it's unlikely that there was a shadow in there, or anything like that. And I can't figure out what it was because it was slightly more than just something in the corner of my eye. It's very odd. Sammy asked me if I'd been doing my protection rituals and I do them fairly often because they're nice meditations. And I will get Sammy on and we'll go through some of those meditations. 
But so far doing the podcast, I haven't felt scared out of my wits or anything like that. The figure shape, I'm going to chalk down as a trick of the light. I was trying to do too many things at once. I saw it. It felt like there was someone there waiting for me, but I didn't feel scared or threatened, just a bit surprised. But there is something else about that corridor. For months, I've been able to smell something, and it is not a good smell. It smells like dirty body, and I don't mean like sweat or BO, just like caked on really dirty smell. I can't describe it properly, and I've searched and searched for the origin of the smell, but I can't find anything. I've pulled out the shoe rack, I've lifted the rug, I've at one point I had my face pressed into the carpet trying to locate where this smell is coming from, but I have no idea what it is. It's not there all the time, it's just the odd waft. I shower every day, sometimes twice, so it's not coming from me. It's the kind of smell you get in places where there are a lot of homeless people or on buses sometimes when you get sort of poor, very poor people. It's a definite body smell. I'm, I am going to hire a carpet steamer at some point, just go ham on the carpet all over. But I have a sneaking suspicion that whatever the smell is, it's not in the carpet. It just seems to be in a pocket of air in the corridor. And it just so happens that that's where I saw the dark figure. And then it comes and goes, this smell. It's not there now. I can't smell it at the minute. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. Have we got ghosts or am I slowly descending into madness? And now I'll stop banging on about me and get on with the show. So this month, we're going back to Bradford with my good friend Ellen, to the Midland Hotel specifically. I'll give you a bit of history and then talk about the ghosts as usual, or one ghost in particular, a famous ghost, a thespian, if you will. So the Midland Hotel is an absolutely stunning building that sits at the terminus of Bradford Forster Square train station. It's a grade two listed building and is famous for hosting celebrities, which is strange to me because, well, Bradford. I'm joking, it's not that bad. Mostly. The hotel was originally built by the Midland Railway Company and was considered to be a showpiece for the business's northern offering. Construction of this architectural beauty began in 1885 and five years later, in 1890, it opened its doors to the public, or rather the elite. When the Midland was built, the main entrance would take you straight from the station platform up through the waiting area and ticket offices and into the hotel itself. And that part of the hotel still remains and it's fucking glorious. On its completion, the Bradford and County Conservative Club decided it was the perfect location to entertain Lord Salisbury for lunch, which is why it has gained this reputation for being an elite place. Lord Salisbury was a Marquess who, at that moment in time, had just been made Prime Minister for the third time. The Midland Hotel gained a reputation after this fancy affair for being a very prestigious place to rest your head, so it's no wonder that the likes of Laurel and Hardy chose to stay there. As well as celebrities, every Prime Minister since the hotel's construction right up to Harold Wilson stayed at the hotel for varying lengths of time. Lord Salisbury set a precedent. It's also played host to George Formby, who spent a night at the Midland in 1940 after a sellout performance at the Alhambra, and many more big names such as Sean Connery, J.B. Priestley, Tom Courtney, Michael Palin, Gene Simmons and my man Bran Stoker. But it wasn't to last. At the end of the steam age, the hotel began to lose its purpose. It was no longer the proud beauty it had been, and by 1960 was completely derelict. And it remained that way for over 20 years. It seems like sacrilege. In 1992, it was bought by John Pennington, who restored it to its former glory and renamed it the Pennington Midland Hotel. It was subsequently bought by Peel Hotels in 1998 and its name was reverted back to the Midland. Can't be classic, can you? So, what is the Midland Hotel like today? In 2023, the Midland Hotel is a three-star hotel. It has an old money feel to it and the location is handy for transport links, but Bradford is a far cry from what it once was. It's a run-down, grey town, not dissimilar to Dewsbury. There is something very West Yorkshire kitchen sink-esque about it. It's hard to explain to anyone who's never lived in Yorkshire. There's a terrible drug problem in Bradford and rampant homelessness. But despite this, it's, it's a very multicultural place. But that has also given rise to a particularly scary kind of extreme right-wing politics among some of the white folk in Bradford. 
In some ways, going to Bradford feels like you're looking through a window into the past. It's like the 80s. Have you ever seen This Is England? Funnily enough, though, as I mentioned in the Bowling Hall episode, there has been a history of Asian settlers in Bradford since at least the 11th century, and the majority of black and brown people who live there today are here because we invited people from other countries to the UK to work for us in the 60s and 70s. Let's just say that the Daily Mail is a prominent newspaper in Bradford and leave it at that. Forster Square train station, where the Midlands sits, has also changed over the years. It's been around since it was first built in 1946, but it has had several iterations over the years and has actually been moved 300 metres from its original location. Looking back at old photographs, I can see that the station in its current form is a far cry from the original, which was a large, imposing Victorian building, very grand, with several platforms that bustled with people, whereas, as it is now, it's just kind of a concrete block. These days, it's a very quiet little station with two lines in and out, which I suspect is down to the construction of the second and much larger Bradford Railway Station, which is Bradford Interchange. It's a modern-day hub of public transportation. Um, Bradford Interchange was constructed in 1973, but it had been in the pipeline since 1972, which just so happens to coincide with the demise of the Midland Hotel. By this time the landscape of public transport had changed drastically since the Midlands heyday and there was a rush to keep up with the demands of faster, more affordable travel and the latest technology. The Midland Hotel is a large hotel with 90 bedrooms. Until earlier this year, it was owned by Peel Hotels still, but it was recently bought by Britannia Hotels. It looked like the new owners were keen to keep the historical aspects of the hotel as they are when we visited, but you never know what they're planning to do with it, and let's just hope that they don't mess around with it too much. The front of the hotel faces a busy main road, and there are building works at the minute, which made it look a little bit unimpressive from the outside, despite the fact that it is a beautiful building, the architecture is stunning. But the moment we were inside the main entrance, we were faced with huge mirrored doors that were ornately decorated with raw iron flourishes. Stepping inside felt like entering another world altogether. As the door closed behind us, we found ourselves in a large hallway. Two froofy looking sofas, almost chaise long type sofas, flanked the entrance and on both walls were marble art installations which I assume were made up of parts of the old hotel that were just too beautiful to dispose of, so some flourishes, cornices, that sort of thing. The entryway was lined with large cream tiles and the floor was shiny, so you know it's posh. I like a shiny floor, it reminds me of being on holiday. Once through the entryway, we found ourselves in a large reception area. Smallish round tables were scattered around and people were chatting in friendly hushed tones over bar snacks and drinks. To the left we could see the check-in desk for the hotel rooms and to the right was a small bar, so we made a note to come back and carried on with our investigations. One of the first things you notice as you enter the hotel proper is the sweeping staircase on the left that takes you up to the rooms and suites. Raw iron and dark wood banisters snake up towards a mezzanine floor, twinkling fairy lights leading the way. It's so pretty, it's no surprise that this is a popular wedding venue. But those stairs actually hold a dark history. Our ghost, a former actor, met his demise on this very staircase. So obviously, we went up it. It was a quiet day at the hotel. There had been a wedding before we arrived and we'd just missed the rush, so we were undisturbed as we poked into conference rooms and investigated nooks and crannies. It felt incredibly peaceful in the hotel. Even the bar area was quiet. It had the hushed reverence of a library. The grandness of it all added to the ambiance and there was a feeling like an old school men's club and not the working kind. It was easy to picture gents in coattails, sporting drooping moustaches and puffing on pipes behind oversized tabloid newspapers. Sipping brandy and merely nodding to each other to signal a formal greeting. Very old school. I did feel a tad underdressed. I usually wear shorts, tights, converse, dockers, something black and floaty. Ellen looked cracking in a black maxi dress and she sort of fitted in, but something about my shorts just made me feel like I was being a bit disrespectful somehow. Not that the staff seemed to mind at all, they were nothing but delightful. Once we'd exhausted our avenues on every floor, we came back downstairs and Ellen took me into a little corridor. Had I visited with someone who didn't know the hotel, or had I come on my own, I'd have missed it entirely, and all I can say is wow. It was the old station entrance to the hotel, and then I really felt like I'd stepped back in time. 
Beautiful and ornate sea-green tiles lined the walls halfway up and then continued in a pale coral. It was hard to be sure, but they look hand-painted. A floor made of thin, dark wooden slats sloped off in front of us and curved away to the right. On the left-hand side, there was a Victorian luggage rack, which the porters would have used to transport guest suitcases up to their rooms. I could imagine imposing ladies in large fancy hats barking orders to porters and refusing to carry anything, you know, in case they made their white gloves dirty. And several young men lugging around hat boxes and wheelless brown leather suitcases over to the rack to be taken up to the rooms. On the right-hand side of this area is where the old ticket office once was. Sadly, you can't go through that door, I tried. So it's probably a storage room or something equally as functional now. There's a sign above the door that says, you may telephone from here. Going through a second set of doors, you see fancy benches on a raised footpath at the edge of the walkway. And here was a trailer for luggage with suitcases on. And what did I see? Flipping Bram Stoker's suitcase. Wherever I go in life, there is Dracula and, more prominently, Bram Stoker. He's everywhere. It's a good job I'm a fan, isn't it? Round in the corner, you've got a sweep down to the exit. Victorian lamps light the way from the walls. Not gas lamps anymore, but they are Newton bulbs, so they give off what feels like an authentic glow of light. It was such an unexpected and perfectly preserved pocket of history that I nearly burst into tears, but I didn't, because I'm a grown-up. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the ghosts at the Midland Hotel, or one ghost in particular. After we'd finished exploring, we headed to reception to check in with the ladies working there. One of them said she hadn't ever had a spooky experience in the hotel, but the other one looked at her aghast and said, Haven't you? I have. This is a bit of a random question, but I do a podcast about ghosts. Ghosts? Yeah, so I just wanted to know, have you ever seen anything in the hotel? Do you have any spooky tales? I wasn't in an experience. (laughs) Have you? Was there. Okay, so I was stood right here, my customer was right there, and someone said Shirley, and there was absolutely no one in the back office or nobody. It's also happened to Beth. Beth was walking towards me, I heard someone call Beth's name. She did as well, we both looked and nobody was there. That's the only thing I saw. Spooky though. So a very short tale, but it gives you an idea of what a lot of staff members and guests experience on a daily basis. We did ask the bartender and he was absolutely fantastic and came over to where we were sitting having a beer to tell us about the strange goings on at the hotel. Doors opening and closing by themselves, glasses falling to the ground and smashing when there's nobody around. Strange echoes and voices. This place has it all. But one thing seems to be for certain is that there's only one ghost at the Midland that we can name. And here we are back at Bram Stoker, slightly. Again, it's not his ghost, but he was there. Every time, there he is, Bram Stoker. But Sir Henry Irving was a well-respected actor. Born in 1838 as John Henry Brodrib in a small Somerset village, Henry Irving was definitely not raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. His father was a salesman for a local tailor, and his mother was living in a time when women weren't allowed to work or own property, so there's hardly any mention of her anywhere. Sir Henry Irving was obsessed with the theatre from an early age. After leaving school, which I'm assuming was around age 12 in those days, he became a clerk in a merchant's office. But he never let go of his dream of the theatre. He would daydream about the players and the plays at the London Theatre. And in 1856, he was given a small legacy of £100 from an uncle. It seems strange to say that buying props for amateur dramatics was an investment, but it would turn out to be the best venture he could have made. As well as swords, wigs and costumes, Henry also paid his way into a production of Romeo and Juliet at the Royal Soho Theatre. This was the point at which he changed his name officially to Henry Irving because it was customary to adopt their stage name. He went down an absolute storm in the production and, encouraged by the warm reception, he joined a theatrical stock company in Sunderland. This is where Bram Stoker comes into the picture. Genteel Bram first spotted the enigmatic Henry Irving in his role as Captain Absolute in The Rivals, which was being performed at the Theatre Royal in Dublin. Bram was just 19 years old at this point, but he was absolutely obsessed from the minute he clapped eyes on Henry. But the two wouldn't meet for another nine years, when Henry would return to Dublin with his much-lauded adaptation of Hamlet. In 1871, Henry was cast in The Bells at the Lyceum Theatre. 
He had been an established actor before this point, but this was the performance that shot him to fame. He became basically a household name, or as much as you could in the Victorian era. In 1878, he became the manager of the Lyceum and developed his own theatrical company with great success. He toured all over, breaking into America and taking the world by storm. And after several interactions, Bram Stoker became Henry's manager and devoted friend. But it wasn't to last. In 1897, he suffered several financial disasters and things started to go rapidly downhill. His friendship with Bram Stoker was also cooling off around the same time. Bram had married and that seemed to hammer some nails into the coffin of their relationship. There has been much speculation, but Bram Stoker was also a close friend of Oscar Wilde. You could say that the poor man was gay or bisexual, but back then nobody was allowed to be who they actually were, so it's really hard to make any claims for real. I have my suspicions, but then, as a proud bisexual slash pansexual slash omnisexual, no idea what I am, I think everybody has the capacity for all kinds of love. It does seem likely that there was a much closer relationship going on than just a friendship, although whether that love was unrequited or not, we'll never know. Take this quotation from Bram's friend Hall Kane on his death in 1912. Much has been said of his relation to Henry Irving, but I wonder how many were really aware of the whole depth and significance of that association. Stoker seemed to give up his life to it. It was not only his time and his services that he gave to Irving, it was his heart which never failed for one moment in loyalty, in enthusiasm, in in affection, in the strongest love that man may feel for man. And I say without any hesitation that I have never seen such absorption of one man's life in the life of another. Bit telling, don't you think? How sad. There has also been speculation that Bram based his most famous character, Dracula, on the famous actor. Given the macabre feel of Henry's plays, it's not a huge stretch of the imagination to accept that that claim is true. Henry Irving was a tall, dark, slender man, very gothic looking. Had there been a stage adaptation of the novel in his time, he would have made the perfect Dracula. The romantic anti-hero searching decades for a reincarnation of the love of his life. Sadly, Henry was planning to retire to Cornwall after his farewell performance in 1905. He had performed Tennyson's Beckett at the Theatre Royal and Opera House in Bradford. His accommodation for the evening had been booked at the Midland Hotel. He was a famous actor after all, so only the best would do. Bram Stoker had made the trip to Bradford to see his lifelong friend and eternal love in his last performance. Talking to reporters after the death of his bestie, Bram said... We chatted for a while after the play and I left him, although not notably strong, not in any way cast down, and not more exhausted than had been usual for some time. A little more than three quarters of an hour afterward, I was sent for by the man who attended Sir Henry from the theatre, who told me that he had fainted or collapsed on entering the Midland Hotel. Hurrying down, I found Sir Henry lying in the passage, dead. Bram also stared... Had he died on the stage, as might have happened, it would have given shock and bitter memory to many tender hearts. After his final performance, Henry had spoken some words to his manager, Bram. Take care of yourself, old chap. Good night. God bless you. And then, mounting the stairs, he swiftly collapsed and died. He had had a stroke. Since then, guests and staff alike have experienced many bizarre things. So I'm just going to tell you about an actual paranormal investigator called Kenny Charles and his ghost hunting team. So Kenny Charles was intrigued by the mysteries surrounding the old hotel and he contacted them to find out if they had any stories to share with him. They very quickly got back to him and said that yes, the hotel was haunted and when did he want to come and investigate? When he arrived, he was told by the manager that she absolutely refused to go down the hall to the ballroom. So she handed him the keys and left him to his ghost hunting. Using something called a melmeter, which is a device that needs to be touched to be activated, Kenny announced to the ballroom that he was going to count down from five. When he reached one, the melmeter was activated. Kenny had taken a medium and a cameraman with him to the hotel. The medium suggested that the ghost may be Sir Henry Irving, and since the ghost was active and willing to communicate, they should set up a tripwire on the stage and then pretend to be an audience. So they set up the device and began clapping and cheering. 
Again, they were not disappointed. The trip wire was activated. I'm really sorry if you can hear Ava purring. I can't get her to go away. Um, Kenny also took some photographs and saw a figure in some of the shots. He had been told that the ghost in the ballroom was female, but looking at the photographs, he concluded that it was, indeed, dark and mysterious Sir Henry who had activated his trip wire. The cameraman also reported having his coat pulled, and the moment was even captured on camera. There's a video on the Telegraph and Argus website, which is the Bradford paper. You can see this moment as it happens, but I can't embed the video because it's not on YouTube, but I'll link the article in the show notes. So did we see ghosts at the Midland Hotel? No. We didn't even feel vaguely creeped out anywhere in the hotel. Although I wasn't my best, honestly, so I probably wasn't quite as in touch with with my intuition as normal. There was a very soft, cosy vibe to everything. We did a thorough explore. We went all the way up to the top of the building. We roamed softly lit corridors. We peeked into conference rooms. There's a suite called the Irving Suite, named after the thespian whose ghost is forever trapped in this ornate hotel. There's also a plaque on the outside of the main entrance to the hotel that reads, Sir Henry Irving, famous actor and impresario, died here in the Midland Hotel, 13th of October, 1905. If his spirit really is there, I don't think he minds so much. It's very grand, as mausoleums go, and from what I've read, Sir Henry was something of a narcissist given to delusions of grandeur, so he's probably very well suited there. Not that he's there in body. Sir Henry was transported to London after death, where he was cremated at Golders Green Crematorium, and his ashes were interred at Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. Not bad innings, all in all. Still, he seems to have lingered where he performed his last play, if the rumours are to be believed anyway. Fellow actor Ellen Terry once asked Henry how he would like to die, and without hesitation he said, like that. So he died as he wished to, having performed his last in beautiful surroundings, and while I don't believe that the consciousness of the dead hang around after death, perhaps Sir Henry has left a theatrical imprint of himself where he drew his last breath. Who knows? All I can say for certain is that the hotel regularly receives reports of strange goings-on from staff members and guests alike. So we're back to ratings. I'll give you the ratings for the Midland, but I didn't actually stay there for the night. So I can't speak for how the rooms are to stay in or what the breakfast is like or anything like that. It just, it seemed like an expense when I could just hop on a train home and be back with my tiny family. Potential ghosts experienced by Scaredy Cat. None again. We had a lovely spooky time talking with the staff, but we saw nothing untoward ourselves. Scare factor one out of ten. It's just a really lovely hotel. Perhaps if I was there by myself at night time, I wouldn't feel so confident, but while we were there, we felt nothing but comfortable and at ease. Value for money, seven out of ten. The rooms range from £50 to £120 a night, which is pretty good considering how central the hotel is and how lovely it is inside. Drinks were fairly reasonably priced at just over a fiver for a pint, which is pretty standard. Family friendliness, eight out of ten. Probably great as somewhere relatively cheap but clean to stay with kids. There's not much for them to do there, but you have all of Bradford on your doorstep. The Media Museum and IMAX are just a short walk away, and the City Park Mirror Pool is also nearby. It's a shallow paddling pool surrounded by fun jets of water that you can run through and colourful lights and things like that. It's it's absolutely stunning at night, and it's great for a warm day, and apparently we have those now. Accessibility, 8 out of 10. There are fully accessible disabled rooms and toilets. There's also disabled parking spaces. Time spent two hours for exploration and drinks. Beauty spot, seven out of ten. So this was difficult because inside the Midland is stunning, but outside it's Bradford. And parts of Bradford are great and it definitely is on the up and up again. But the location does detract from the beauty of the hotel somewhat. But then once you're in there, you don't feel like you're in Bradford. So you know, swings and roundabouts, I guess. Customer service, eight out of 10. The staff were lovely and willing to talk to us, which is always welcome. And now I've got something that sounds like a horror film to read to you. Honestly, this scared me. Okay. So this one is called When a Skeptic Uses a Ouija Board, The Results Are Unexpected. I've just got the one story this week because it's a long one. And it ties in quite nicely with my recent spooky happenings. 
minus the Ouija board. I haven't done that yet. So strap in. This is from Lucy, who lives near Tintwistle. So that's near my neck of the woods. I'm from Glossop, and Tintwistle is one of the, the small districts near Hadfield. So Lucy says, I have a scary Ouija board story for you, and you are not kidding, Lucy. I was at a house party at a friend's house back when I was a student in Manchester. It was about three in the morning and most people had left by this point. There was a small group of us sitting on the stairs just chatting and drinking. It was one of those old brick house shares and the paint was coming off the walls and it was a bit of a mess. It's student housing, you know what it's like. And it was absolutely freezing cold. Middle of winter and all the windows open to get rid of cigarette smoke and the weed smell. Lol. So my friend turns to me and goes... This place is haunted, don't you know? I'm going to call her Karen because she refused to talk about what happened afterwards. She just stopped laughing with us and suddenly got really serious out of nowhere. I laughed and rolled my eyes at her because I thought she had to be kidding, but she didn't laugh back. No, really, there's this really weird stain in my bedroom and I can't get it off, she said. I laughed again. Well, the place is a bit of a mess, so it's not that strange. And then Karen got this really weird look on her face and said that it was greasy and she couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So, having had a drink, I was feeling a bit bold. We went upstairs so she could show me. It was weird, yeah, but people had obviously been parting in there because there were beer cans everywhere. It was really hard to see, too, because the light was really dim. But it was this creepy-looking black stain on the carpet that led from a second door that had been painted shut all the way to the bed. I asked Karen what was on the other side of the other door, but she said she didn't know. She hadn't been able to get it open. But then she said that sometimes at night, it sounded like someone was knocking from the other side. Karen was on the top floor, and she had that floor to herself. It was just a bedroom up there in a converted attic. So I went over and tried to open it, but it was completely stuck. I even knocked, but nothing knocked back, obviously. I figured there must be something on the other side that was causing damp to seep through and possibly rats or mice or something. It's Manchester after all, everywhere is damp. But she was right. It wasn't just damp, it was greasy like an oil stain and the floor was spongy underneath which was the most worrying thing. I told her she had to get the landlord to come in and clean it up and also open that door because it was a health hazard. The knocking was probably just nightmares or too much weed or something. When we went back downstairs, the others had gone into the living room and were in the process of getting a board game out. It wasn't until Karen started going put it away that I realised it was a Ouija board. I wasn't really superstitious back then, but I wasn't keen on the idea either. There were a lot of stories about Ouija boards going bad, you know, why risk it? Karen was getting louder and louder and saying that the Ouija board was the reason this was all happening in the first place. Nobody else listened and they got out some candles and started playing. I gave Karen a beer and told her they were just being idiots and she calmed down a bit. It was a bit shitty of them to do that to her, they seemed to think it was funny. The others messed around with a board and a glass for ages and ages but nothing was happening. Eventually Karen said she was going to have a go because they weren't doing it right. It was totally the opposite of what she'd just been saying, just a complete about turn. As soon as she sat down the glass started moving. It was so fast, it spelt out whore, kill, hell fuck you and bitch just a load of awful stuff it was whizzing around and around the board getting faster and faster and the words were starting to get misspelt eventually Karen took her hand away from the glass and it fell over and spun around several times before stopping she looked at me shocked I went over and picked the glass up and as I did there was this almighty banging from upstairs and Karen looked at me with this look of pure fear in her eyes and went That's what's been happening since we moved in. A couple of the boys said they'd go and check it out, and we followed them to the bottom of the stairs. As they reached the landing, all the lights in the house glowed really brightly and then went out, including the candles in the living room. We went and relit them and held one each as we all went up the stairs together. We were all scared as hell by this point. The light from the candles was shaking and I could hear people breathing heavy. We'd all been quite drunk earlier, but this just sobered us all right up. As we reached Karen's bedroom door on the top floor, we realised that there was a dim light still on in there, but it was the only light in the house. One of the guys said it must have its own power source or was on a different breaker or something, but when we went in, we realised it was coming through the cracks in the locked door. One of the guys said, I don't like this, and just as he said it, there was a cracking sound and he stumbled and dropped his candle. His foot had gone through the floor where the stain was. The carpet was dipping badly, and we pulled him away and backed onto the landing, where the candle had set fire to the stain on the carpet. 
I wasn't really thinking. I ran back in and took my shirt off to smother the flames. And just then, the lights in the house came back on and there was a sharp banging from behind the locked door. I just bolted. I could feel the soft floor sinking up more under my feet as I scrabbled back to safety and we all ran downstairs. We all stayed in the living room with the lights on until morning. When the girl from beneath Karen's went in to check the damage, she found a hole in her ceiling so there was old plaster everywhere and some broken planks that were sodden and had rotted away. A lot of her things were covered in this black, oily stuff and it made it harder to get the paint flakes and plaster off. She straight away packed a bag and went home to her parents. Karen moved into my room in my house share around the corner. It was very cramped and my boyfriend was annoyed by it, but I wasn't going to send her back to that house. I think every single person moved out of that house within a week. The only thing Karen would say about the whole experience was that it had started the first time someone got the Ouija board out and that something bad came through. One of the boys turned up at our house one day. He'd nip back to pack up the rest of his stuff and he went to take a metre reading so they wouldn't get charged after moving out. The metres were in the cellar. He was trying to see and shone a torch at the wall and realised that someone had written kill on the wall in red paint. The top floor of the house was condemned eventually. The landlord hadn't done any due diligence on the place. But then this was the 90s and health and safety regs weren't as rigid as they are now. I think it's still there, the house, but I'm never going anywhere near that place again. I actively avoid it now. We all kind of drifted when we left uni, but sometimes I see one of them pop up on Facebook as a recommended friend and it brings it all back again. Sadly, Karen got into trouble, dropped out of uni and got into hard drugs. I haven't heard from her or seen her in 25 years. She's not even on Facebook. Sad, really. It all really stopped me from having a good time at uni, just that one incident. This happened in second year, so for the rest of that year and the year after, all I wanted to do was finish my degree and leave. Some strange things did happen in our house share after that too, but nothing as dramatic. I'd put something down and it would move. Quite often the shower would turn itself on for a few minutes and go off again. I'd see things out of the corner of my eye, like dark figures. You know, when you just know something's off. It all stopped when Karen disappeared, so whatever it was was attached to her. I've got into smudging more recently, so if ever there was anything attached to me, I've saged it right out of here, lol. Hope you like my story. I'm going to be so happy if you read it out on the podcast. Love what I've been reading on the website. Oh, I didn't think anyone was reading my blogs. Although I think you're in for a bit of a shock, scaredy cat, when you do find strange things happening to you. Be careful with the hunts. You don't know what you're opening yourself up to and stay away from Ouija boards. Thank you for that, Lucy. I can completely understand why that would mess with the rest of your time at university. I feel like Karen may have been the perpetrator of some of these things. But, you know, open mind and all that. So I've just got some thanks and housekeeping. Firstly, this is the corrections fairy. In last month's episode, I missed out a key factor in the strange call from Kent that went through to Stephen's phone that he told me about on the podcast. As well as receiving the two calls and the garbled voicemail, Stephen also said that the voicemail mysteriously deleted itself. So he wasn't able to listen back to see if he could hear anything more clearly. Spooky stuff. And I've got an addition to a story from last month as well. If you cast your mind back, you may remember Gina's story of her grandmother's funeral and the gust of air blowing through the door, carrying on it the scent of her late grandmother. Well, I was able to find the recipe for the bright green cocktail, or rather, I was given it. The sawn puddock. And the reason I haven't been able to do so thus far is because it's had several different names over the years. I was finally made aware that a sawn puddock is very similar to a drink known as Kermit juice. And the recipe for Kermit juice is as follows. 50 mils of passion fruit liqueur, 50 mils of blue curacao, 50 mils of galliano, and then top it up with orange juice. I mean, that sounds very sweet. I'd probably leave out the orange juice, honestly. And there you have it, an ectoplasmic cocktail that would make Slimer proud. As always, the show notes for this episode are on the Scaredy Cat Skeptic website at scaredycatskeptic.co.uk and you'll find all the links to the podcast players on there. You'll also see the full list of episodes and show notes. Initially, the podcast was using SoundCloud as a feed for the website, but I ran out of space and so I've moved over to YouTube, which I actually prefer. You may have noticed that the last episode had a video slideshow of all the photos we took from Rip and Workhouse and if you haven't, go and check it out. Um, I've done one for this episode too. The photographs are also at the top of the show notes page, but that's not all of them. There are some additional ones in the slideshow and they're on there along with the names of everyone mentioned on the pod. There's also a full transcript because I know some of you have said that you occasionally don't understand my accent. 
One thing I will say is that the transcripts are really big and I do try to edit them so they make sense. But occasionally the transcript tool can't understand me either and I, I'll, I'll miss it during the editing. You can always contact us for clarification if you wish. Huge thanks to everyone who has downloaded, rated and or reviewed the podcast. We made it to 195 in the Apple charts a couple of weeks back, which makes me very happy. If you haven't rated us yet, please do give us a five star review on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. We are absolutely blown away by the responses to the podcast that we've had so far and we'd love to keep bringing you bigger and better episodes. And that's all down to you, our listeners. Do you have any ghost stories that you want to share with us? Visit the website for more information. We're on all the socials. X, we're at Scaredy Skeptic. Instagram and TikTok are easy. It's just Scaredy Cat Skeptic. Facebook is facebook.com forward slash SCS pod. LinkedIn, the business page is linked to me. So you can just head over to LinkedIn and search for either Scaredy Cat Skeptic or Emily Dewsnap. And that's Dewsnap as in D-E-W-S-N-A-P. Our YouTube channel is Scaredy Cat Skeptic 6937. And I'm not sure why, but hey ho. Please do your usual liking and subscribing and all that lovely stuff. It helps us to keep going. Thank you to Ellen McMichael, who suggested the Midland Hotel as a haunted location and who also accompanied me on the hunt. Special mention, Tom Bramwell, as usual, for the concept art for our Scaredy Cat mascot, Maud. We were gifted some of the fabulously spooky music you heard by composer G.W. Monday, who approached me via Mouldy Rotters, which is a musical about the undead. You can see more of that kind of thing over on YouTube at Mouldy Rotters, and they're also on Instagram. Our theme music is by Diamond Tunes. See you next time. Happy hauntings.